Hello, Year 6. My name is Mr. Braniff. Um, I'm the Head of History <coughs> excuse me, at uh, Beckett Keys School. Um, when you start at Beckett Keys in September, um, myself and my colleagues will be teaching you all about life in medieval England, uh, often also referred to as the Middle Ages. And uh, one aspect of uh, life in medieval England that uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, today for 10 minutes or so is, as you can see there from the slide, the influence of the uh, Christian church. And uh, in particular, the influence of the Christian church on crime and punishment in medieval England. Um, so there are some learning objectives there that you can see, a few things that I'm going to try to cover in a very short space of time. So um, <clears throat> we'll see how we do. But um, you're going to look at how the church was influential in all areas of life. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, you'll also look at the relationship between the church and the monarchy. Um, so the monarchy, i.e. Um, the king, and uh, in particular, Henry II. And uh, we'll also look at um, if you were accused of a crime, uh, what were the punishments uh, that you could look forward to uh, if you lived in medieval England, uh, including something that's called sanctuary? So without any further ado, let's start by looking at what we mean by the medieval period or the Middle Ages. So as I said, um, some textbooks or some uh, historical sources, whether it be a website or whatever it might be, a documentary, <clears throat> will refer to it sometimes as the medieval period or medieval England, and some will refer to it as the Middle Ages. But in essence, all you need to really know is that when we're talking about this period, we're talking about the end of the Roman Empire, which is approximately, as it says there, 450 to 500 AD. Uh, and the Middle Ages or medieval period ended uh, when the Tudor reign started. So some of you again may know this, but um, the picture there that you can see of the very famous Henry VIII, um, it was his father, Henry VII or Henry Tudor, who was the first Tudor king or queen of England uh, after the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. <coughs> so. That's what we mean by the medieval period or the Middle Ages. Um, and in particular now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how uh, and talk about uh, the Christian church and how influential it was. And as it says there again, the Christian church was extremely powerful. Uh, you cannot really overstate how powerful it was um, as an institution in the Middle Ages. It controlled... Well, basically, again, as it says there, it controlled the thoughts and minds of people. So, for example, if, you know, someone was ill or someone had died, then essentially it was linked to the church. Um, if someone died of, let's say, for example, the Black Death, so you will study about the Black Death later on. Um, many people at that time believed that the Black Death was sent as a punishment by God because people were sinning. Um, so, as I said, you know, it, it really did uh, impact on all aspects of life uh, and crime and punishment is just one of those aspects that um, we're going to look at today. Uh, and as I said, you when you start in September, um, pretty much the majority of year seven, you will be covering uh, medieval life uh, with your history teacher. So um, the, the church, I mentioned this earlier, um, also clashed with the monarch, um, the monarch being the king. Uh, and in one particular example that some of you may already be aware of or may have already learnt about is how Henry II clashed with uh, Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, which led subsequently to the murder of Beckett. Now, if you don't know who Beckett was or you've not studied Beckett, don't worry because, as I say, you will study that uh, in uh, your year seven lessons when you start at Beckett Keys. Uh, but um, this is just an example again of the clash that took place between the church, the power of the church, uh, and, um, and, and, and the monarchy. Uh, 
And this clash uh, would, as I say, manifest itself or would show itself in specific examples, as I say, uh, the Henry II and Thomas Beckett clash is, uh, is probably the best known one uh, and the one that we teach um, halfway through year seven. <clears throat> so um, hopefully you can see this image. Uh, this is a painting from around 1350. So circa 1350. Um, and this shows one of the um, trials by ordeal. And, um, you know, a thousand plus years ago, there was no such thing as a, a judge and jury uh, that we have today. So if you think about, of course, if someone is accused of a uh, terrible crime, say murder uh, or something particularly heinous, um, someone, uh, that person will then uh, be put before a jury and a judge. And of course, the judge will determine whether that person uh, is sent to prison or not, or um, in other countries, of course, uh, whether that person maybe has uh, dealt in even harsher penalty. But in this country, uh, over a thousand years ago, uh, there was no such uh, method of punishment. Um, and in Anglo-Saxon England, uh, justice relied heavily on religion when deciding whether someone was guilty or not guilty. Um, so the accused could be tried by church authorities in a trial by ordeal. Uh, and this was really the test to decide whether or not you were innocent or guilty. So let's say, for example, you were accused of uh, theft or murder or whatever it might be. Uh, one method that was used to determine whether you were innocent or guilty was this hot ordeal. And this hot ordeal, which you can hopefully see here shown by this painting, is where this man has to pick up an iron bar. So a bar that has essentially been you know, uh, made very, very hot. And when you pick it up, your initial reaction is just to want to drop it immediately. Um, but this person would have to carry it maybe five or maybe 10 steps. And um, if the person's hand uh, healed within a certain number of days, so let's say a week or maybe you know two weeks or whatever it might be, then um, the church determined that that person was innocent. But if, of course, which is probably the more likely because of the fact that, uh, you know, over a thousand years ago, uh, they didn't really have Savlon or antiseptics uh, in which to heal terrible burns or scalds on your hand. Uh, what is more likely is that this person's hand would have got very badly infected and that would have been a sign of their guilt. And so that person then would have been punished whether it be, you know, through a fine or something more severe, that person would have been punished because his hand had not healed in a certain number of days. Now, um, that was just one of the trials by ordeal. The other trial by ordeal was the water ordeal that you can see hopefully at the bottom here. Now, again, it might be a bit tricky to see, but actually what we, I'll, t I'll show you essentially, or tell you what, uh, is, is being shown here. It's a woman being dunked into a river. So she's being tied up and she's being dunked into a river. And if she floated, uh, or if she was able to swim, and you've got to remember again that most people could not swim, you know, there was no swimming lessons or swimming baths then. Um, if she did happen to, you know, be able to float or swim, then that was a sign of her innocence. But as I, you know, as I'm sure did happen, um, that many people actually drowned and that was seen as a sign of their guilt. Now, clearly, as you look at this, there are going to be many, many flaws with this method of punishment. As I said to you, because of the fact that if we take uh, the, the hot ordeal as the example, you now because they didn't have, or at least they had very basic knowledge of how to uh, heal someone's uh, burnt hand, um, it's very likely that in the majority of cases, in fact, probably I would say pretty much all cases, that someone's hand would not heal very quickly. And so therefore, even if you were innocent, um, the fact that your hand didn't heal meant that you were then deemed uh, uh, guilty anyway, and you would be punished accordingly. And it's the same really with um, 
as I say, with the uh, you know water ordeal that, as I said to you again a moment ago, that for the vast majority of people, I'm sure pretty much everyone, uh, you know, swimming or people could not swim or were not able to actually stay above the water. Um, so really these two methods, if we look at them now, a thousand or so years later on, are very much flawed. Now, uh, when the Normans came to England in 1066, after the Battle of Hastings, they introduced uh, a different method called the trial by combat. And the trial by combat was introduced, uh, as I say, after 1066. Uh, this method was used to settle disputes over larger sums of money or land. And um, two people would essentially be given a sword, or in some cases a wooden stick, and they would have to fight to the death. Um, if you gave in, then essentially you were later put to death anyway. So, you know, there's no point in you giving up. You had to fight to the death. And it was believed that God had punished <clears throat> the loser and, of course, had saved the winner. Now, in some cases, depending on how wealthy you were, you could pay for the best or one of the best swordsmen in your village or in your town to fight on your behalf. So let's say, for example, if you were guilty, of stealing or if you were uh, you know guilty of your uh, crime um, if you were wealthy then you could pretty much pay your way out of it um, so it was very much again a flawed system um, so these are the three uh, main methods that were used during the anglo-saxon times before the Normans uh, came to England in 1066 and then after 1066 that were used to determine whether someone was guilty or innocent. In later medieval England, uh, other ways that were used to determine whether someone was uh, innocent or guilty was what's called the benefit of clergy uh, and also sanctuary. Now sanctuary um, was essentially where the church gave protection to someone who was accused of a crime. Um, but there was uh, a few different aspects to it that I'd like to go through with you now. Uh, if the church did offer <clears throat> protection or sanctuary, and uh, you've got to remember that not all did, so only a few um, churches up and down the country actually did offer sanctuary, um, the person was given approximately 40 days uh, to then leave the country. So you had to swear an oath that you would leave the country within 40 days. And if you did not, then you became what's called an outlaw. And an outlaw essentially was then a hunted man or woman uh, and uh, not something that um, you, know, you would want to be um, because sheriffs all up and down the country would be looking for you. And if they caught you, then you're in serious, serious trouble. So sanctuary was this method of protection, at least for a short period of time. But it did end in around 1536, um, and that was during the time of Henry VIII, um, who basically decided that um, he didn't want anyone in this country to uh, be protected by the church courts um, through sanctuary, and essentially had that ended through an act of parliament. So um, the word sanctuary or sanctuary today is not very well known. I'm sure your parents, probably very few of them, would know what we mean by sanctuary. And I you know, would take a guess that many of you, if not all of you, would probably never heard of it either. And that's because, as I say, nearly 500 years ago, sanctuary ended in this country. So there's some of the methods of crime and punishment uh, that were used in Anglo-Saxon and Norman England during the medieval and uh, Middle Ages. If you want to know more, and of course, uh, you know, many students do want to know what life was like uh, in the past. If you want to know more about life in medieval England, here are two websites that I would suggest you go and have a look at. Uh, the first one is the History Learning Site, and the second one is History for Kids. Now, both of them have many, many pages that you could find out more about life in medieval England and all different aspects just in terms of, you know, what did young children do for fun? What type of work did people do uh, in the countryside or in the towns in medieval England? You know, <clears throat> um, why else, apart from going to church services, did people enjoy spending time at church? Um, so lots and lots of things to find out about. And hopefully you will do some of that before you come back to school 
uh, and start, should I say, at Beckett Keys in, uh, in September. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there now and uh, wish you all the very best. Have a lovely summer and uh, I'll see some, if not many of you, in September. Take care. Bye-bye.